Hey, this is Doc Solo, the OG from Generation Geek, and today we are diving in to the new player on the block, the new imprint from Image Comics, Ghost Machine, specifically Red Coat. Run the clip. Hey, 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 Doc Solo here. I am the OG from Generation Geek and welcome to our newest book review. You guys uh, were great on the last one and uh, we're going to make this a thing because you guys seem to appreciate uh, whatever I had to offer. And so I'm grateful. We are grateful for you guys that are supporting us, all the Gen Geek fam. And so, yeah, we're incorporating this into the rotation as the channel grows. A little bit about me, I am DR Solo Perry, I'm the Pops, I am the director and the founder of Kapow, the Comic Art Academy, the real art school for real people with real lives taught by real pros, and I've been a 30 year industry pro from both animation to video games to comic books, and I have my own studio, Honor Studios Entertainment, and I love to spend my time here now on Generation Geek. And so, I'm bringing that to the table, I'll bring that to the front because I want you guys to kind of get a little insight, those of you who are new here, as to who I am and why I may be somewhat qualified, jury's still out on that, on reviewing books of this caliber, or of any caliber for that matter. And so anyway, welcome, thanks for hanging out. Um, we are going to be diving into uh, a new uh, imprint from Image Comics, Ghost Machine. Now, some of you guys may not know who Ghost Machine is. Um, they are a new conclave of industry heavy hitters. When I say heavy hitters, I'm talking heavy hitters. Okay, from Jeff Johns, Francis Manipal, Jason Fabok, Brian Hitch. And so as I review uh, the titles thus far from Ghost Machine, uh, we're gonna get into the micro because as anybody knows who's done this for any length of time, that the more expertise you garner and the more you refine your craft and uh, the more, the more uh, excellent you become at doing the thing, then commentators have to come in and they have to really go micro because you've got largely the broad strokes covered. And that's where we are here with Ghost Machine. Um, yes, we're going to be reviewing indies and, and mainstream all over the spectrum, but it's going to be a sliding scale. You got to understand that. And so with that being said, uh, let's take a look on uh, into what we're going to be diving into today. Now, keep in mind, issue number one of Red Coat. Let me just start off by saying this. <laughs> There's nothing on this cover, as you can see. This is what's called a blank sketch cover. Now, the reason we don't have the original first printing cover is because I buy sketch covers whenever the opportunity presents itself because I am a professional artist and I get my fair share of commissions. There's some people out there who actually like what I do, uh, but I'm trying to get better in spite of. And um, I wasn't gonna spend twice as much on two different covers. And so I'm gonna probably put this in post. Let me make sure this is nice and lined up so I can boop, drop it, boop, right there. <laughs> okay, the original cover. That's the uh, magic of post editing. Uh, but we're gonna be diving into Red Coat, which I must say is out of all the Ghost Machine books that have been released thus far, it is probably my favorite. It's probably my favorite. I'm getting Highlander vibes. There's magic. There is some real attempts at character development that I find fascinating. But before we go too far, let me explain to you how reviews here work at Generation Geek. All right. So we're going to be breaking up to five distinct categories. All right. Number one is story. Just what it says. How does the story read? Is it a journey? Is it a trip that we want to go on? How is it executed? Uh, then secondly, art, which in my opinion is probably the most divisive and scrutinized area in the comic graph is the craftsmanship of the art. Is the artist hitting the notes? Is it supporting the story in an adequate way? Hopefully an excellent way. All the things that come, is it drafted well? Is it colored well? Is it inked well? even the lettering. We, we lump all that into the art critique. And then it's characters, character development. You know, we as an audience, we bond 
and attach ourselves to specific characters in any given story, right? And you're in who and who you identify with is who you identify with. And so, with that being said, we're gonna we're gonna rate the characters, and then there's quality, overall quality of the book. That's the physical quality. Does it feel good in the hand? Is the paper quality there? Is it printed well? Uh, is it bound well? All the things that kind of enhance the buying experience. And then next is XP, or we call experience. How did I feel purchasing this? Do I have buyer's regret? Do I feel that they gave me my money's, money's worth? Or did they over deliver? These things matter to the consumer. And last, the final score. We lump all those together, we come up with an average, and sometimes if the average lands on, on the dotted line, I may tip it one way or the other way, how I feel just in my gut where it deserves so that we land in a nice clean, clean place. And so all these are rated on a five dub scale. Five dub, see that's above head? That's the dub, that's the double G here at Generation Geek. And so we rate everything on a five dub scale. Five dubs are possible. We don't mind even the dreaded half dub, <laughs> okay? And so let's dive in to my breakdown of Red Coat. First, check this out. What's up, guys? This is Jay. As you guys know, we love making content for you guys. But as we're starting to notice, many of you are watching, but many of you are not subbing. So why not join the G-Geek fam? Come rock with us. Just hit that sub button, hit the bell. We'll love to have you. Y'all be blessed. Peace. We are back, and let's go ahead and begin our breakdown of Red Coat. Now, first of all, I got to say, I found this very interesting. When you look at the cover, you might look over here underneath the, the logo imprint, and you'll see five names. That's the entire creative team. This is not typically a thing in comics historically, but honestly, I don't hate it. Uh, this is Consider this the, um, the billboard, the billing. And usually you have the writer, you have the artist, and um, you may have the colorist occasionally, or the inker, right? But here they gave props to even the letterer. I think that's pretty cool. What I did find a little bit interesting was unlike most sketch variants, there's no interior cover. See, typically when you buy a sketch variant, this cover goes over the top of the original book. Kind of like this, right? This is issue number two. It's nice heavy card stock. And there will be a cover like this over the top of this where you can take it to your favorite artist or, um, you know, professional or somebody meet at the con and say, hey, you know, I want this character done on this cover. And that's, it's good money if you can get it. Trust me. All right. And so, yeah, I thought that was a little bit interesting. And that seems to be a running trend with their blank sketch variants. And so anyway, we start off, uh, the story takes place. It starts off in 1775. What I like about this is that it's historical fiction. And uh, I'm a history buff. I love history. And anytime you can attach myth to history, I think that is a huge recipe for success. Now, before I, I get into too far into the review, let me make sure you understand this. These are my opinions, okay? These are my opinions. We like what we like, and that's okay. That's okay. Yes, I have some experience. I've got some skin in the game. I have my own studio. I have a school. I do this constantly, but we are free thinkers and we encourage free thought. And what's better than having these conversations in the comic shop with your peers. You know, the whole craft is largely subjective. So what I try to do here at Generation Geek is similar to the approach that I have at cons when I'm dealing with, you know, students and aspiring artists. It's from an objective craftsmanship's point of view. Now let me, let me state this uh, before we go any further. This is just my own personal hypothesis, okay? Art is largely subjective. But comic books and the art therein, it's a craft. I like to refer to us as craftsmen. Why? Because there are benchmarks of accomplishment and of expertise. Kind of like, you know, this, this table, right? If it fell apart, it, it wouldn't be much, much of a desk to speak with. But when we talk craftsmanship, what establishes it as a sturdy, reliable, well-varnished piece of wood, the rivets, that's craftsmanship. That means somebody, a carpenter, fabricator, 
they were skilled at their craft and they went in and put their best foot forward comics is a lot like that and so when people say comics is artistic i'd say it's less an art and more of a craft because we kind of have uh, agreed upon expectation when it comes to the art. We have agreed upon expectations when it comes to the writing. Uh, the lettering has to look a certain way or we notice it. The coloring has got to look a certain way or we notice it. All right. And when these burdens aren't met, it's poor craftsmanship. Now, the actual approach and where you come, how you approach the actual execution of everything, the part that is you, that is your individuality, that is the quiver of your hand or the quirk in your brain, uh, how you like to spin dialogue or take us through the journey. That is the art part. And though it's a fusion of both, I try to approach it from a craftsman standpoint. That kind of leaves the subjective part out of it because we have rules like perspective. We have rules like anatomy. We have rules like pacing, right? These are things that make comics more of a craft, in my opinion, than it does an art. Even though there is hefty artistic application and components involved, we're craftsmen. All right, and so leave your leave your, <laughs> your thoughts in the comment. I love, to, I love to hear your take on this, okay? And this is an open dialogue. As long as you're respectful and you have something insightful to say, I'll pop in and I may respond. All right, so we move forward. All right, so Red Coat by Jeff Johns and Brian Hitch. This is going to be a very quick review. I'm not gonna go through both books as I have here. At the time of this recording, there are two issues in. We are just two issues in at this point. And so I'm not going to go too far down the rabbit hole because when I tell you I think this is worth the purchase, especially at the price of $3.99, you might wanna go ahead and invest in it. I don't think you'll be disappointed, okay? I don't think you'll be disappointed. But this tale centers around the figure Simon Pure. All right, he is our and he's our protagonist. He's our protagonist. And real brief overview: he is. It's 1776, uh, the Revolutionary War. America wants to break away from Great Britain. Taxation without representation. We know the hit what the history books say, right? And so Jeff Johns and Brian Hitch they build upon that history. Brian Hitch actually being a Brit. And Jeff Johns being American, I think that's a really good fusion um, of potential perspectives as we navigate this story. But this is this is early on. This is very early on. So again, the jury's still out. But let me tell you something. I liked the first two issues. Let me let me be clear. Let me lead with that. All right, because we have Brian Hitch who's doing his Hitch thing. If you guys have not seen Brian Hitch's work, do yourself a favor. Go check out Ultimates, the the series that actually launched what launched the MCU really okay it's pattern after the ultimates Brian Hitch I think has been doing the professional art thing maybe since 14 15 I actually have a book that I'm going to be reviewing on Kapow my other channel um, that kind of goes that's my educational thing where we kind of go into the educational aspect more so than I do here um, but I, there's a book that he actually did that shares his process which I think is fascinating but Brian Hitch is a modern day master. We're not gonna go too far down the rabbit hole. As you look, look here, I mean, it is beautifully rendered. The environment, nothing is skimped upon, which I think is a testament to his craftsmanship, not just his drawing ability, but to his craftsmanship. He hits us with all the details that keep us immersed in this story. And quite honestly, I don't know what you think about Jeff Johns, um, but I kind of dig the story. So what the story follows, the story follows this, uh, deserter of the British army. And I've seen this play out before. Uh, what comes to mind immediately is, um, uh, from DC comics, Jonah Hex. And if you guys saw the Jonah Hex movie, um, they, he was a Confederate soldier, which is largely frowned upon historically, as well as the Redcoats. Now, the Redcoats were the Brits, as we know this. But in order to make them sympathetic, they make them um, turncoats to their to their side, okay? Uh, for whatever the reason is, may, may, philosophical, whatever, they may be forced to fight for that. I don't know. But it seems to be a common uh, mechanism where you take a character that we should detest and you make him... Uh, you make him likable 
okay? You make him uh, digestible. And so Simon Pure is a red coat who's actually, you know, deserting. And of course, the US forces don't know that because he's of the red coat, okay? But he stumbles across, I'm giving you a brief overview. He, he stumbles across a ceremony uh, in the church just as he was hiding where <laughs> Benjamin Franklin is about to undergo some type of uh, transformation, okay? And we have, it, it looks very occultish, which I, 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 I love it. Um, we have certain visual cues here like um, the Union Jack, so we know there's a Brit there. And of course, Ben Franklin, one of the founding fathers, you know, he raises some visual cues in this story that I think are amazing. We see the framing here that draws our attention to what's happening right here on the page. This is all a framing me mechanic and brilliant. He's a master, so I'm not going to go I'm not going to go too far into critiquing him. Now granted, he has his flaws, and if I were to critique him, um, Brian Brian Hitch Brian Hitch has a tendency to occasionally um, uh, disconnect from anatomy. You ha you'd have to know what you're looking for to 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 really catch it. But we'll, we'll get into that more as we get to the art side. But let, let me stay. As you see, I'm, I'm geeked about the art. So let me let me dial it back and go into the story. All right. So we have this ceremony with Benjamin Franklin, who's about to go this ceremony of immortality. All right. Our and our protagonist, he interrupts it. He gets hit by the thingamajig, right? Boom. He doesn't know how it works, but now for some reason he's immortal. This book is giving me heavy, heavy Highlander vibes, and I don't hate it. I'm here for it. I'm so here for it. I was a huge Highlander fan. There can be only one, right? And so I think that they're kind of pulling from that. Um, and again, not a bad thing. Just because you may be able to spot it doesn't mean it, it, it doesn't work, okay? It doesn't make them any less creative. What it does make them is innovative uh, if i may say as long as they're not pulling note from note from a pre-existing property i'm down for it and there's enough deviation in the story that really makes this uh something that i think i'm going to continue to follow moving forward uh, the character is largely likable he's aloof he is not meant to be a soldier he is carefree he is uh, irresponsible okay he's kind of like your lovable loser and uh, I think that was an interesting way to go as opposed to making him very super heroic and your 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 typical, you know, um, uh, leading man character. He's kind of like the buffoon who looks up on these on these powers and um, he's just trying to be who he is. And I think that, that I think that was a pretty good approach with this character. Um, I, I'm here for it. Um, some interesting things, some interesting things. Uh, one of the things I think may be potentially problematic whenever you're dealing with things that have uh, stories that have either time travel or a lot of flashbacks, you can confuse the reader. And I think there's a very real danger in doing that here because uh, Jeff Johns bounces around from time periods. We see it here, 1790, 1827, 1892, right? And so... Yeah, you may get a little lost if you're not really paying attention, right? November 1892 is where we wake up from his from his incident. And that's like 117 years later after the incident. And so he hasn't aged a day. The thing that I found interesting is that the, the darn red coat, <laughs> is it? I don't know if it's immortal. I don't know the significance of keeping the red coat at play over 100 years later. Uh, maybe the red coat is immortal. I don't know if that's, I don't know that I, I found that very interesting. It may seem like a, a minor thing, but when you are dealing and talking about, um, people that are at the highest level of the craft, all you really have is the micro to go into. Okay. And so again, a lot of grace, a lot of mercy, because these guys are excellent at what they do. Um, but yeah, it's still a little, little bewildered by the, 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 Refusal to change dress a hundred years later. Now I'm not completely certain on the fashion um, evolution <laughs> during that time, but I'm pretty sure after a hundred plus years, fashion would have gone in a different direction. We're in that we're in the Victorian era at that point. 
and he's still wearing this red coat and i'm pretty sure many americans ain't forgot what that meant even a hundred years later i mean we're you know 300 years later and we still know what the red coat represents so i i, I don't I, I don't know the point of that but he starts to oh my gosh i'm trying not to go into the art part okay but <laughs> whoo brian hitch is a master but he's, he's a bad boy um actually i think i'm gonna cut the story short he uses a lot of the story review part. I think he uses a lot of historical reference. We get Albert Einstein. We get Benedict Arnold, right? We get creative views. Um, I like the fact that the magic that's at play here is apparently Native American in nature, okay? And the Founding Fathers, excuse me if you hear my cynicism, uh, the Founding Fathers even got that from the Native Americans. And... Uh, melding this mystical aspect that was already native to the land um, that is now co-opted by um, the colonizers uh, I think is very interesting and so I'm, I'm curious to see how far down the rabbit hole they go with the magic element but so far in these first two issues it's a core element of the storytelling and um, in storytelling one of the trickiest things to nail down for all you aspiring uh, writers um, is the mechanics of magic, how magic works in your world. It can break, make or literally break your entire story. And so far, um, the mechanics of the magic seem to be pretty solid. And I'm interested to see how far they go with it. Uh, but he travels, he's traveling through time. We're only two issues in and already he meets Albert Einstein, a young Albert Einstein, who's who seems to be very adept uh, or at least receptive to the mystic world because his sister had a dream um, back in their home country of Germany and they even have him you know speaking in broken English with a, a very heavy German accent as his genius he's only been speaking English for a few days it hasn't been that long to, to really hint on how smart Einstein is really really good use character usage here I'm digging it um, yeah this is issues one and two of Red Coat I'm going to just really briefly go through issue two. Again, we get more Albert Einstein, and uh, we we get these guys. Mind you, it's a hundred something years later, but they find him. So apparently, whatever this ceremony is um, that he interrupted with Ben Franklin, as far as immortality that he intercepted, they want it back or whatever. Again, great setup. Um, I'm here for it. I'm here for it. I'm so here for it. I don't want to give you the whole story, but when I when I tell you it's an it, it's interesting and I'm 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 here for it. I I really am. And if you hear me fumbling, it's because I'm so excited to get to the art. And so let's get to the art. Let's get to the art. Brian Hitch. Well, first let me back up. Story. If I were to give the story a rating uh, on this, I will give the story out of five dubs. We're gonna give the story three and a half. Dubs. Three and a half dubs, a little bit above average, but I wouldn't expect anything less from Jeff Johns, who's worked in movies and television and is a comics mainstay. And so I feel very confident at this point. I don't I don't want to give it much more because it's still so early in the story, but we're going to give the story of Red Coat. We're going to give it three and a half. Dubs. All right now on to the art. Brian Hitch does his thing. He has a very realistic style. Uses a lot of photo reference, but he never skips skimps on the detail. A little little sidebar that I addressed earlier. Brian Hitch will, uh, when he works, he works large. And I say, well, comics are typically, um, the pages are 11 by 17 pages, right? That's that's the boards that we work on, 11 by 17. Well, according, according to Hitch, by his own words in the book that covers his process, he tapes those together, and so he works at two to three times the size of a normal comic book artist, which ex really explains the clarity of the read, despite all the detail. Because he's working at such a large size, um, the detail, he can really get in there. And then once it's reduced, typically comics are reduced, I believe, 67% from typical 11 by 17. I think it's a 67% reduction. Uh, it, either 62 or 67, I forget sometimes. But... When you're talking about twice that size, it really gives you a lot of real estate with which to work. And he does not skimp on any background. And to me, a true testament of his mastery is the fact that I'm never lost in the page. 
he doesn't clutter it with details to the point where you get visually lost, like a lot of guys who do hyper-realistic or uber rendering that I'll get to later on another book that I, I didn't care for nearly as much from Ghost Machine. Um, his is all, it reads very clear. And that is the mark of a true pro at this craft is clarity. One of the things I teach my students all the time at Kapow, you confuse them, you lose them. Everything has to be clear and concise because we lack other forms of sensory input. And so, um, he does the thing now let me let me be honest as much as i love his work um i am not i am not a coveter of his work and what do i mean by that artistically for me artistically and creatively i have my own scale for which artists fall for me number one the lowest is respect anybody who enters this this as a career or as a uh, as a as a pursuit, immediately you get my respect because it is a lot of heavy lifting. It's a lot of heavy lifting, right? It's a lot of muscles to develop. Anybody who takes on comics, even at the smallest independent level, just know the solo gives you respect, right? Right above respect, though, right above respect is I appreciate your work, right? That means you hit all the benchmarks and I can appreciate what you do, right? There's, there's, there's room for growth, but you're not absolutely sucking at the craft. Okay. So yeah, I can appreciate your work above that is I follow your work. Now, when I follow your work, now I'm learning from you. Okay. Now I'm learning from you. That means you got some things in your toolbox that creatively I absolutely have to have. And every artist, especially at the pro, pro level, we are forever students. And so when you hear another artist say, man, I took that from you, right? I'm stealing, I'm stealing that. I gotta, I gotta take that, man. That hand, that eye, or that beat in that story, the way you paused in that three, three, that, that, that three, um, uh, that three arc sequence, you know, the three act sequence, man. Yeah, I had to, I had to, I had to take that. That was very creative. For that twist that you put in that story, man, I had to take that. That, that right there, that's the huge compliment. When I am learning from you, okay. And above that is I covet what you do. That means I want to sit at your table, okay. Um, that means I am doing a deep dive into you and I'm buying everything that you put out. There's not a whole artist, a lot of artists that I, that I do that with, uh, Brian Hitch. I used to covet his work. Um, but now I'm just a huge follower of his work. I'm a huge follower of his work. I'm not really, uh, taking things from him in, in the sense of to add to my own repertoire, not nearly as much as I used to, but that's the evolution of the craft, right? That's kind of, you know, that's kind of how you should progress, right? At first, you're trying to take from everybody, and then that, that pool kind of gets smaller. Um, and that's because he does some things. He has, and I think it's, if I, could, I would love to hear his take on it, but there are some things that he does that I find a little bit unattractive, uh, particularly as good as he is with hands, sometimes he breaks the hands. Right? He's not above breaking the hands. And occasionally, I think because he uses reference, uh, I teach this to my students at Kapow. Just because something exists in real life doesn't mean it's going to read well when frozen, right? When you freeze a pose, doesn't mean that it's going to look well. It's not going. It's going to look digestible as a pose, even though it may be completely anatomically correct. And he does that quite often. And even like right here, right? This hand right here. Let me let me let me let me move to the split so you guys can see what I'm talking about. All right, so if you look at this right here, this hand right here, this hand is broke. Something wrong with it, okay? This pose right here, that hand should be palm facing away and kind of probably releasing this chair based on um, the construction of the chair and the position of the body. That hand is probably le letting go at that point. Almost Imagine swinging a bat. Right now, you, even with a bat, you have both hands together, right? But even when you finish the swing, most batters let go of it, right? With the outside arm, okay? And then this, this hand right here is facing 
backwards. You've seen the back of it. If my back is facing towards you, you've seen the back of that hand. It's little breaks like this that I noticed because I was learning from him so ardent, so ardent, ardently, ardently, and passionately that uh, when I started seeing these consistent breaks, thumbs being too long, you know, sometimes his thumbs look like fingers. They're so long. Uh, but overall, again, we're talking micro at this point because he's still a master. We're talking micro things, at, micro things at this point. But these are how you learn. This is how we encourage our students. You know, you learn by not being a fanboy, by, by going through it with a critical eye. And every artist has it. We all have things that we do well and things that we don't do so well. The, the only difference between a high-end pro and a rank amateur is the fact that the pro does more things well and messes up infrequently. That's it. That's it. Okay. That's that's really that's really it in a nutshell. And so with that being said, <laughs> the art is top notch. I give the art on red coat. I give it a five dubs on a five dub scale. The art gets five dubs on a five dub scale because Brian Hitch is that guy, and I never regret purchasing anything that he puts down. Anything. Um, the characters, again, I'm we're early on, but you're already giving me Albert Einstein. You're already giving me Benedict Arnold. You're already giving me, um, uh, I don't know if it was Thomas Jefferson or you're giving me Ben Franklin. You know, you're already, I'm like, okay, I just want to know where you're going to go with these people. Now, granted, Ben Franklin, I believe, didn't survive into the next century, but you're giving me this, these historical figures in a uh, fantasy uh, story. And I'm, I'm here for it. I'm, I'm curious to see where you go from. I'm, I'm excited. And I like Simon Pure as a character. I think that he is um, very likable, right? I, I think that he's relatable on many levels, e even to the point where in, in uh, it talks about how he made his living as a hired assassin, right? We kind of get flashbacks to his life. And he says he made his living as a hired assassin, but he was never a good shot. But certain things you get better with over time. And so now he's 100 years in and now he's a good shot. That kind of stuff is, is brilliant to me, right? It's those little quirks, those little nuances that he didn't, he wasn't good at anything really, except for being pretty much a charlatan. And so, um, yeah, very relatable, very likable characters. I give the characters on Red Coat, I give them the four dubs. We're giving the characters on Red Coat four dubs out of a five dub scale. I'm, I'm, I'm here for the characters. Um, now, the quality of the book. We have great vibrant colors. We have a cover that is a cardstock that isn't glossy. The oil is not being, um, it's not pulling off the ink, the oil on my fingers, right? And we all have these this little oil. My fingerprints aren't left on the pages. It's, it's a high quality print. They're vibrant, the whole nine yards. Man, the quality, what, what would you expect from Image, right? Granted, Image has been hit or miss. I don't know how much, I don't know if there's like a standard um, printer that they all use, but who's ever cranking out these books for Image, top notch, top notch. And so for overall quality, especially at the price of $3.99, you're, you're, you're getting another five dubs. So we already got five dubs uh, for art. We got four dubs for character and we got uh three and a half dubs for story only because we're so new into it but the quality i have to give it five dubs hands down hands down now the overall experience of reading this book um my favorite book thus far my favorite book thus far from ghost machine um i'm 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 curious at the very least because i really don't collect anymore at the very least, I'm here for this one. I'm here for this one. And on that note, um, final score. But first, check this out. All right. All right, all right, all right. All right, so we already have, let's review really quick. For story, we have three and a half dubs. For art, we have five dubs. For characters, we have four dubs. For quality, 
quality, print quality, quality and feel of the book, we give it five dubs, especially at the price of $3.99. I hope what I'm hearing through the web is true, that the mainstream is going to be following suit because th for those of you all know, in image is not mainstream. I got into a debate with this, with this guy on a um, super slice channel a while ago. Image comics is not considered mainstream though. They are a major player. The mainstream in comics is definitively Marvel and DC. They are the ones that set the benchmarks, set the bar that were established as early as what the 1930s, 1940s, and have been around ever since that have major media entities that have been behind them for decades. They are the mainstream. As, as impressive as Image and IDW and Boom and other publishers are, they are firmly independents. Now they may be high in independents, right? Elevated independents, but they are considered independents nonetheless. And so it seems a little bit unfair to have a player at this stature considered independent especially at the level <laughs> that i'm working on i'm a small independent with my studio but it just is what it is okay they are a major independent and so for overall score we're going to give this new imprint ghost machine on red coat okay okay we're just talking about red coat we're gonna go into the other ones later but red coat i want to start because this is my favorite one that ends up at four and a half dubs on a five dub scale, which that's a lot. That's that's high. That's high. It's not too many books that I can think of that um, I can see moving forward, especially in today's marketplace, that will rate that high. Uh, whereas like do yourself a favor. Enjoy the read. Enjoy the experience. Treat yourself. That's red coat, in my opinion. Now. One thing in closing that I will say about Ghost Machine as I started looking at all of their titles is I do believe uh, we had this conversation at the comic book shop. I do believe that with Jeff Johns at the helm, Ghost Machine is intended to be an IP farm, which again is not a knock in any real way. I think it's smart business. I think every property that they're releasing is in the hopes that one of those properties translates to larger media, either streaming or big screen or both. And so um, these feel like that, right? All of the books I've read so thus far, they feel like pitches uh, for major media. Red Coat, I would watch. I would watch. I miss Highlander, <laughs> okay? And if this is a spin on Highlander where he runs into other immortals. It's funny, one of the other immortals is is Benedict Arnold. There's not too many of them. Benedict Arnold. Man. And so, um, fun read. Fun read. I, I think that you will not be disappointed. Um, check it out. Tell me what you think. Leave something in the comments. If you have a book that you'd like me to review here on Generation Geek, let me know. It doesn't matter. It could be your book. All right. Uh, if it's something that I'm inclined to buy, I will buy it. If not, you might want to send it to me and I'll make sure I send it back if you give return postage. If you want me to re re review something um, that I am not inclined to purchase on my own. But I am purchasing these, okay? And there are some that I have a little bit of re regret with and some that, I, some that I actually have no interest in keeping. So with that in mind, I was talking to Jay. I was talking to Jay and um, we really wanted to do something special for our Patreon. Uh, supporters uh which we are we're new on the patreon scene and so check us out and there's a link in the description uh in in addition to winning original art that you may have seen the sketches for the versus battle you know those little opening intros that are drawn that's me drawing those those are original art my original art goes for a respectable price in the marketplace i will say it's respectable because uh, i'm not a big name um but i am a professional with some creds uh, we're giving that stuff away and in addition to art I'm not trying to increase my comic book collection at this stage of life actually I'm trying to unload okay I am at that transitory crossroads place where I'm not trying to have a whole stock room full of old comics and so I will be making some of the books that I review if they're not 
some of, by some of my favorite artists like this. So you're not getting this. <laughs> but if there are books that I'm on the fence on or just good reads that I just don't care to have in my collection, I'm going to be giving those away on our Patreon. Okay, that's something we're going to be doing here at Generation Geek because I'm not trying to... You guys should see my studio. Okay, I'm not... I don't have a whole lot of room. I don't have a big house. Okay, um, we live comfortably. Uh, my wife and I and you know, grandkids come over, but I'm not trying to keep all these things. And so I'll let you know as we move forward, what books or join our Patreon. And we'll probably be giving these away at the middle tier, at the second tier, okay? Um, but yeah, I'll be giving away some of the books that I review here. And if you have a book that you want to promote and you're willing to give it away and you want me to review it, email us, okay? Our email is in the description of this channel and we'll check it out. And so with that being said, like, follow, subscribe, keep it geek. I'm Doc Solo, the OG from Generation Geek. Listen, we appreciate your support. We're having fun here and we will continue to do so. And until then, until the next review, amen. Solo out. Peace.